Hi, welcome to the Julie Rose Show. Hi, Eric. Hey, Julie. Today is Tuesday, December 10th, 2019. And the much awaited Multiple Probations podcast number three. Right. You ready for this, Eric? I'm ready for this. Are you? <laughs> I, will, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If I'm being honest, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> They keep encouraging me from the other side of the veil that I can do this, we can do this, it'll be just fine, and yeah. it'll be good. Yeah, well, <laughs> the pattern the patterns repeated itself, right, of the typical persecution from the other side of the veil oh, yeah. and on this side and getting ready for the... We know it's time to do the podcast, so... <laughs> it's, it's huge. In fact, before we get started, I want to make a, a couple of announcements as to why we are getting pummeled over here. Yeah. First and foremost, of course, is because we're doing this podcast. Also, because Eric is just about finished with his book. <laughs> Do you want to give the title of your book? Are you ready to announce that yet? I didn't. I didn't talk to you about this before we did the recording. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> it's going to be called uh, "Doctrines of Ascension," and I, I expect that to be released and available on Amazon within a week. So I'm excited. So awesome! Yeah. I'm so excited. Thanks, I asked Julie. Eric if I could please have the first copy, and so sorry guys, he's gonna put it on Amazon, and we're not telling any of you when, and then I'm gonna buy it, and then after <laughs> I buy mine, then you guys all get to buy yours. <laughs> so that's the plan. Just so you know, that's what happens on the back end. Um, I'm super excited about that book. Also, I've been working on a book with another guy that's the main writer on the book. I'm just adding some things and editing and making a few corrections and, and things like that. Um, he has taken basically the words of my podcast and put that into writing as far as some of the doctrinal outlines and things like that. We've been working on that for about five, almost six weeks and are up to about 160 some pages. And so pretty, pretty exciting. It's moving quickly. I'm very excited. That book could come out in 10 years. Mm. <laughs> Eric said to me yesterday, I see seven to 10 years. It's a little ahead of its time. And I was like, I don't know. It's going to be at least a couple and the spirit just kind of said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what kind of persecution are we in for, Eric? I don't know. So. <laughs> but, but just to clarify, this book, as I understand it, is not just podcasts, just because, you know, it's you can go to the podcast. podcast books for that. It's... Right. That's the other thing. Eric's been helping others with transcription and editing of the podcast books. We have one, two, three, and almost four out, right? Two and three are out right now, and we're working on four. Four right? will be, um, is available now for pre order. Um, oh, okay. For ebook. Um, and those will both go live. The paperback and the ebook will both go live January 9th. So that's cool. right around the corner. So Eric and I, and several others on the back end, have been very busy. This is why we get uh, attacked by the adversary the way we do but it sure is fun isn't it eric yeah it's good, good stuff. right i'm having fun i don't know if eric's having fun he's doing all the editing of the transcriptions and i'm just kind of like that looks good and i read the final i do the final edit i'm like sounds good <laughs> looks yeah. good he's doing all the hard labor there um still busy with clients on my end every day and then the energy class is coming up if you want to come to layton layton utah that um is it layton yeah layton all of a sudden, I was thinking Logan. Layton, Utah, on Saturday, January 25th, 2020. That's my next class. And i um, super excited about that. It's called War on the Wasatch. We're going to go into what I see in the Wasatch, some things I haven't ever disclosed before regarding the foreign troops, some of the earthquakes, some of the other disasters. I'm going to go into some of that during that class, clear energy on that. And something else that came to me last night that we need to talk about in regards to the Wasatch is what I see as far as cities of light and some of you that are concerned about whether or not you get to return to your homes and stuff stuff like mm. that. We'll talk about more than just the Wasatch. I'm going to give an overview in the United States, some of Europe and some other things um, if you guys ask those questions. And um, more and more I have permission from the other side to let you ask the questions and to answer them on things that I have been a little bit sheepish about. Um, you know, not wanting to give information too soon because then people are accountable. I'm accountable and things like that. But we're moving along in the plan just fine. Things are working great. And I'm getting permission to say a lot more, clear some, we're going to do some DNA work, um, spiritual and physical DNA work on everything from Epstein-Barr and Lyme, uh, 
all the health issues you, you can imagine. So when you come to these classes, you'll be getting cleared of, of a lot of that, as well your ancestors. And we'll also be answering questions, uh, dealing with some premortal and um, and life energies from past probations and things. Doing some dimension work. For those of you that have not learned anything about dimension work, um, well, I'll explain some of that when we go into it, and blueprint work. I'm not going to go into that now, but just a few teasers for you guys for January 25th. That's great. I'm looking forward to that class. I'll be there, and a few others of your team will be there. It'll be good. Yeah, it'll be good. Um, and, of course, at that class, I will talk about multiple probations, about some things that I can't do in a public setting on a podcast because not everyone's ready for it. But I assume if you're coming and doing energy work and coming to the class that you're ready for the information that I'm going to disclose in class on January 25th and subsequent classes as well regarding multiple probations and how to identify your probations and things like that. And I'm assuming that, so. that, that you're doing that in your class in part because you can release energy, negative energies on yeah. a higher level when, when with that context of multiple probations. Yes. Yeah, it'll help them clear energy on past probations, past creations, uh, pre-mortal stuff, and, and the energy follows. We're going to talk about that in today's podcast. This is Multiple Probations 3 podcast. Eric's got some questions and some other things, and, and a brief outline we did this time just to get a rough idea of what we wanted to cover today. We're going to divide this up into two podcasts, so we're going to go as long as they tell us on the other side. I think it'll probably be 30, 35 minutes apiece. We'll divide it into two podcasts. So this is the first one. MMP4 is coming next, and they are meant to go together. So if you haven't watched uh, one and two, I suggest you, you do that before you listen yeah. to this one. But, you know, either way. Good call. Good call on that. These podcasts will help you clear energy as well. So, all right, Eric, is, that, is there anything else? Yeah, there is one other thing. Just I, I almost want to mention this more for record-keeping purposes and context for when I go back and watch this. But this was my last day at BYU-Idaho. I just taught my last oh, class. Right. and. Um, so, it, and I wanted to just say that it's been an awesome experience and I'm, I'm sad about it, about because teaching there has been my, my best job ever. It's, it's been really remarkable. The students are awesome. I'm going to miss that association, but it's all part of the, the plan, right? So right. anyway, it just a shift in my life. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the next adventures that are coming. Thank you, Eric. It's been quite an experience watching Eric go through this. Um, I just want to thank you publicly, Eric, for your loyalty to Christ, first and foremost, and for your dedication to your mission, which intersects with my mission and with many of our missions. And I just want to give my sincere gratitude and thanks to you for doing that at all costs, even when there are those who would seek to thwart that plan and to keep you from moving forward in the plan. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate it. So I guess I could say we've been infiltrated at every level, layer, realm, and dimension. <laughs> so while we say that, I'm going to go ahead and expose and reveal any and all darkness on every level, layer, realm, and dimension, including any and all hidden or cloaked energies, and clear my space and clear your space as we begin today's session. Cool. Okay, good stuff coming up. Sounds good. Well, let's jump into it, Julie. Um, good. I have a couple of scriptures. When we discuss multiple probations, it's important to understand this in the context that it is one of the mysteries of the kingdom that's so frequently discussed in scripture that was, excuse me, that was often discussed in the early days of the, the restoration of the church by Joseph Smith. And, right. and I want to remind everybody that we are within our rights, scripturally, spiritually, eternally, to study the mysteries of the kingdom, Right. Yeah, not only within our rights, but we've been charged to do so. Mm -hmm. We made, many of us made pre covenants that when we came here, we would we would study it out. This is school, right? We're here to learn, and we learned it pre and now we're just going to learn it consciously in a mortal body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So, Thanks. Yeah. I want to start with uh, 2 Nephi 2830. It says, For behold, thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept, Hear a little and there a little, and blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts, and lend an ear unto my counsel, for they shall learn wisdom. For unto him that receiveth, I will give more. And from them that shall say, We have enough, 
from them shall be taken away even that which they have. And we see that all over the planet throughout all of history. I love that, Eric. I love this line upon line. I have these people that ask me these questions. They want to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And most often my response is I can serve as a witness to you when the spirit gives it to you, but I can't disclose that on, on rare occasion. I'm able to say something that's not super, super deep or what I consider super deep. Uh, but really the pattern is, is that we get the answers from the spirit and that's from an agency and accountability standpoint. It's an eternal law and the light side, you know, pays attention to those things, right? If Eric or I or somebody else comes to you and, and gives you some kind of deep doctrine, mystery of the kingdom, and you're not ready to hear it, then it's to our condemnation and yours if you don't accept that. And so, um, I'm, I, you know, we're, we're cautious about that. This is a big deal for us that we're doing this podcast, at least for me anyway, right, Eric, that we're doing this on yeah. multiple probations. I think it's exciting. It, it tells me that we have enough people in the galaxies and in the universe on both sides of the veil that are ready to accept truth mm -hmm. and to move into the light and who want to know more and who are eager to learn more about the plan of salvation and the plan of exaltation, because that's what we're talking about today. That's right. You know, you mentioned there are people that are eager on both sides. I, While it doesn't seem like there are a lot of people right now on this side of the veil that understand this doctrine... I want to remind people, we, we get a lot of emails, and you do a lot of sessions with people, and you're hearing stuff, yeah. and, and I talk to people, and I'll, I'll tell you what, I don't know what you think, Julie, but it feels to me like there are an awful lot of people who are embracing this doctrine, but for fear of persecution and ridicule and all that stuff, are just being silent about it. I really think there are thousands and thousands of people in the church that know this doctrine is true, and they're just being quiet. Yes. And there are a lot of people on the planet that know it's true. They might have the misconstrued conceptions of the dark side of reincarnation and karma, but they're waking up right along with those yeah. who are, you know, in the covenant path. Covenant path being a key word that some who have infiltrated are using. I say that on purpose because that term bugs me. <laughs> are we talking about covenant path? Or are we talking about what, what are we trying to do here, really? And what is it actually when somebody says covenant path? What are we trying to accomplish when we come to earth and when we go into the heavens and when we decide to, you know, progress in any matter, whether we go into one of the degrees of glory or we come back to a, a mortal probation to learn more. Eric, do you have your ideas on that? Like what, what's the point of it all? Right. Right. Well, I, I like the term covenant path, but I understand why you're saying you don't because of the context that it's presented in covenant it's been misconstrued and the dark side's, absconding some of that verbiage and it bugs me right and it's and it's being limited to covenants that only take place in this life but when you look at the plan of salvation we make covenants before this life after this life in the context of all our lives and so when yeah. when people refer to the covenant path they usually don't have those things in context and so they're missing the big picture i think that's exactly what it is the actual term covenant path doesn't bug me it's the context and it's the energy that's going into the words that seem incomplete to me. And because I can discern energy and I can see it and feel it, words and thoughts and everything, it's like, are we missing the boat here? Like, let's get to the root. Let's get to the, um, the, the deeper cause or the deeper motivation or the deeper purpose for why we even do any of this. Like, why make a covenant and why aren't we explaining what that covenant is or what it's going to do for us to get us to the next level? Why come and make any kind of promise premortally or on the earth unless we have an understanding of what those covenants mean and how they're going to get us to the next level yeah, of progression? Yeah, exactly. You know? Right. And so I get this I get this frustration energy that comes up because I'm like, but there's so much more. Like, there's so, it's such a beautiful, amazing plan. I just want to shout it from the rooftops. Can you tell? <laughs> I'll try to calm down. <laughs> Let me read another scripture. I like the way it grounds us in the doctrine. And um, this comes from DNC 132, 22 through 25. I love, now that the, this doctrine of probations has been opened up to me, it changes my understanding, my reading of the scriptures, right? Have you had that experience? You're like, you read something, yes. you're like, oh, that totally makes sense now. Um, well, we always hear how the scriptures are layered, right? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. you hear that, and people, do people even know what that means? Right, right. When they say it's layered, do they know what it means? 
Yeah. This says, For straight is the gate, narrow the way that leadeth unto the exaltation and continuation of the lives, plural, and few there be that find it, because you receive me not in the world, neither do you know me. I'm going to skip the next verse, verse 24. This is eternal lives, plural, to know the only wise and true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I am he, receive ye therefore my law. The next verse is also interesting. Broad is the gate and wide the way that leadeth to the deaths, plural, and many there are that go in thereat, because they receive me not, neither do they abide my law. Interesting. Yeah. So when I hear that, I think of a conversation I had with somebody this week. They told me they were at the temple doing ceilings, and the sealer actually, when they were asking questions, tried to open the, open the minds and the hearts of the sealer. The person knew, knew the answer, right? And they said, uh, so when it says eternal lives, what, what do you think that means? Mm -hmm. The sealer said, said, oh, well, that's a continuation of our children with our lives. We just live one life. And I thought that's interesting, right? limiting beliefs or false beliefs that are being passed down because we limit our belief systems mm -hmm. guys when it says lives with an es like that's really what it means right now they they can only take my word for it and i will ask you to take it to the lord but i can promise you i have memories real memories of lots of lives mm -hmm. and i could tell you stories and I have emotions to go with it. I have visuals. I have emotions. I have actions. I have descriptions. I have faces. I have hair color. I have outfits. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this is legit. And it's not just one or two. It's lots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's one more verse here um, from DNC 121. Then we'll kind of move on and loosen up a little bit. But uh, it's DNC 121, 26 to 29. God shall give unto you knowledge by his Holy Spirit, yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost that has not been revealed since the world was until now, which our forefathers have awaited with anxious expectation to be revealed in the last times, which their minds were pointed to by the angels, as held in reserve for the fullness of their glory, a time to come in the which nothing shall be withheld, whether there be one God or many gods, they shall be manifest." All thrones and dominions, principalities and powers shall be revealed and set forth upon all who have endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So cool. <laughs> so we, we don't need to stress out if we don't know it now, right? Line upon line, precept upon precept. But the Lord has given us the promise that one day we will know, right? Right. So how cool is that? So how are we going to know? Um, all of a sudden, somebody's just going to tell all of, all of us all of it at once? <laughs> right. Right. We got to learn line line upon line, and as the veil thins for us, as we get closer to the millennium, and as we're in the millennium, then more is disclosed. That's right. And line upon line to me also means kingdom upon kingdom. And and I just produced yeah. this graphic that shows the building of kingdoms and how that's the Lord's way of pre of presenting more higher doctrines. Doctrines is there's a new kingdom with each level of newer light and, and knowledge and. We're on the brink of another one, and, and we're just yeah. not discussing that. We're not being taught that from pulpits of the church. And I think, frankly, people don't understand the doctrine, but we are on another... Pre um, uh, what's the word? Dispensation coming. It, yeah, yeah. thanks for helping A new that. dispensation, dispensation of the gathering. The dispensation of the gathering is when the 144,000 are gathered, the noble and great ones who are charged with and have been pre-mortally ordained and will be set apart on this side of the veil to fulfill the covenants that they made and that were made to them to help spread a greater message of light to the whole planet and to help bring people to Zion. Whether that's actually in New Jerusalem or different kingdoms on the earth that become cities of light that become kingdoms. Um, and this is legit. This is real. And um, it's been prophesied for a long time. Mm -hmm. And this is where the King of Kings and the Queen of Queens come in. They are the King of Kings and Queen of Queens who oversee the kingdoms of kings and queens throughout both mortal probations and on an eternal scale. And this is where we talk about light worlds being created, galaxies increasing in numbers and size, universes, expansions, adoption into the house of Israel or you know all these other doctrines. It, it goes directly in line and and ties in with the abrahamic covenant with sarah and abraham 
and it goes in line with, uh, you know, ascension into the seventh heaven. And so I don't know, maybe can we talk a little bit about Isaiah for a second? For some reason, that's coming up right now. Good. On the seventh heaven. Good, Julie. That's just one thing I wanted to discuss. I've mentioned the apocryphal record of the ascensions of Isaiah. It's four chapters that were left out of the scriptures. Why were they left out? It was, let me just paint this story here and see if you can follow along that there was this occasion. Isaiah was a little bit older in his life. He was invited into King Hezekiah's court and um, there was this huge gathering of prophets. I think there were 40 or more prophets invited to this to hear him speak. He's, he's in front of everyone, he's speaking, and he goes into this vision. And in this vision, he progresses through seven heavens until he arrives at the heaven where our Father and Christ are. Along the way, it, in each degree, he sees what I think of as a, almost like a presidency, but it's of gods. So you have a, a god on the, on the first level, you have a, a god with a, almost like a first counselor and a second counselor. But the, the narrative is very descriptive about this main being brighter than the ones on, to his right and to his left. And so what we see is this, this variation of glory and exaltation in the members of a presidency. You move up to the next level and they're brighter still, but you still have the three separate degrees of glory for each member of that presidency. Until you, right? Until you go up until, uh, to the throne of God, uh, Isaiah asks to be admitted and he hears the voice of God saying, let him enter, his robes are here. And robes in this case means it's a it's a metaphor it, it's uh just like a robe is clothing for your body um a robe is also a metaphor for our bodies being a robe for our spirits and so we have robes in heaven which are literally our last bodies from previous creations that we worked on and um the lord wanted isaiah to know he has been through those and he's He's back. Julie, do you have something to say there? Meaning he had already ascended. He already had bodies that were there. He had ascended several times to the seventh heaven, meaning he has an ancient spirit. They came from uh, previous eternal rounds. This is what I see with Isaiah. He is. Um, he was there at the beginning of this eternal round, one previous, one previous. And uh, he, he was able to return to that level of seventh heaven because he had already ascended to at least that level. That doesn't mean he necessarily stopped there. He, uh, he had ascended even further than that, but he was allowed into the seventh heaven because he had already been there at least before. And some of his robes were there. Uh, what I see with Isaiah is that he actually had already previously ascended to even higher heavens than that. But this was a doctrine that he needed to learn as Isaiah in the more in mortality and for his missions on earth and I see missions with his other probations that came after that and that there are literal robes and sashes and aprons that represent these higher priesthoods that are clothing that are worn in the heavens um, and yet they are symbolic and also representative so that if someone were to see Christ in a certain color of robe like a red robe versus a white robe with a certain color of sash like a blue light blue sash those are representative of the higher priesthoods and of the ascension levels or degrees for which Christ has uh, uh, the ability to be administrative or to administer to that kingdom or to um, help oversee and, and to help like serve and teach and things like that. So they represent everything. It is not coincidental that Joseph Smith saw Moroni in a white robe and there are different types of white robes. Moroni could have come in his battle armor that he wears pre-mortally. I see him in that more often than I do his white robes, depending on where I see him and where he is in the heavens. And, um, and, and he could have come, you know, to identify himself as a soldier like he had been in his probation as Moroni on the earth in the Book of Mormon. But he chose, and the Lord chose for him, to show himself to Joseph Smith in a white robe. This was representative of his ascension, and his role in the heavens, and um, I'm not going to go into the the what it represents, <laughs> but 
I'm just saying it's important and it represents, and this is why he chose to show that way. Same with Father and Christ when they came, wearing what they were wearing when Joseph Smith saw them, and why they show themselves to me or anyone else in what they choose to wear. I have seen Christ clean shaven, wearing jeans and a t shirt. That's going to probably offend some people. And I see him doing that in New Jerusalem. And I've seen him with longer hair, varying lengths. He likes to keep it about like this a lot of time, but varying lengths. And usually when he has his beard, nicely trimmed beard. I think, you know, most of the time I see him in a little bit of nicely trimmed beard. I think that's probably his preference. But that doesn't mean they're always like that, depending on the mission they have. And Christ has many missions, and he is serving and going all over this multiple universes and galaxies, still accomplishing his mission to rescue lost souls. So he will uh, change his apparel as needed and put on whatever body is needed or robe is needed to do that. And that's the same for any light warrior or any god or goddess that's in this galaxy or any other universe. That's just how it works. That's some really great insights there, Julie. I hadn't thought about the colors being significant of their authority or their stewardship. So Right. When I talk about in my first book about um, seeing some of the founding fathers in their uniforms, they had actually just come back from battle. They were... They were wearing the uniforms, and they wanted me to see them in their uniforms as part of part of the conversation we had about the role they were playing primordially right now. And then the other individuals, the men that I met that were wearing their white robes, when I now I don't talk about this in my book, but when John greeted me, John was in regular what looked like street clothes. He wasn't he wasn't wearing robes now in his day, right? As Enoch or as John the Beloved, he would have worn robes. But when I had my near-death experience, he greeted me in, in like a nice shirt and a pair of khakis, basically. That's kind of what he looked like. And while we were traveling, he changed. He changed his clothes, depending on where we went and what, what we were accomplishing and what he was showing me. I don't talk about this in my book. This is the first time I've ever said anything, I think. I, I don't know if I've ever told you. Or, no. But he, he, he put on a white robe as we entered into a certain place in the heavens and then as we ascended into the heavens we changed our attire Hmm. at one point in time i put on a a beautiful blue light blue gown similar to what mary magdalene wore the same color christ and mary wore when they were married it's symbolic of the priesthood powers that come with that level of ascension Hmm. um when i see myself in new jerusalem there is a certain color gown that I see myself wearing on a, on occasion. In other occasions, I'm wearing a pair of jeggings, just like I do now, and a regular t-shirt. Depending on what the mission is and what we need, hmm. and who we are talking to or working with. Right. I think that's interesting, it right? It's very interesting. I mean, it's, it's what we do here on Earth. If I'm going to go over to Walmart, I'm not going to wear my best Sunday dress, right? I mean... Why would I do that? But if I'm going to go to a nice business meeting, I might put a business suit on. And it, I, it's it's a similar thing. We see the same pattern. We, we see the same pattern in, in the temple when certain people yeah. are told to go down in a certain form, a certain character. Right. It's it's like saying, hey, put on this robe, put on that robe for this occasion. It'll be a little better, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. And, and also it goes into... Um, glory your glory right because as someone ascends into the heavens their glory the uh lower dimensions cannot physically the the laws of the universe the light and dark can't coexist and so you have to adjust your energy so that 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 energy field that you're in or those that you're surrounded by can handle the energy that's coming if we were to try to be in the presence of the lord right now as mortals um, he has to adjust his energy. We can't go up in our vibration. I mean, we naturally do by being around him, but we can't, we can't just do that to get into heaven. There are keys that you have. There are doors and passageways and access points. That's where the covenants come in. Ascended beings can go to lower dimensions. Lower dimensions cannot rise to higher dimensions. It's against the laws of the universe. It's against the laws of nature if you just study the science behind it alone. So. Mm. Great insights there, Julie. 
let me let me wrap up this ascension of Isaiah topic here. When he so once Isaiah reaches the top, um, interestingly, Christ then descends and he goes through those same seven heavens until he gets to earth. And by the time he gets to earth, everyone's forgotten who he was, um, and he they started treating him just like anyone else, and um, which is interesting in itself. And then the dream, the vision closes. Well, Isaiah is standing there in this council of the king and all these prophets there. And he he swears everybody not to reveal this to anyone, um, that it should be written and revealed at a later time. Um, this was, this dream, this vision was so fringe that... Um, <laughs> King Hezekiah died shortly thereafter, and his son uh, uh, Manasseh reigned in his place and had Isaiah executed. Now, this is this is apocryphal. We don't read about Isaiah's execution in the scriptures. I want to point out one reason why I consider the ascension of Isaiah pure scripture that should have always been left in the Bible is because later on in Scripture, we have other prophets and apostles, and this is both in the New Testament and in Latter-day Revelation, Doctrine and Covenants, we see these references to those prophets of old who were sawn asunder. There is no mention in all of Scripture of anyone being sawn asunder. Right. You only get that through this apocryphal record, and, and so it turns out that Manasseh, King Manasseh, was so offended at what Isaiah had seen, he had him killed by Saw. And I just want to add here, uh, I woke up some months ago and it was shown to me how that happened. There was a saw between his legs and they sawed him upward. And um, my understanding is he died about the time the saw reached his stomach, his lower abdomen. So... I will serve as a witness to that. I have memory of the days of Isaiah, having lived in the days of Isaiah. That's going to freak people out maybe, but that's the truth of it. I have a memory of actually knowing Isaiah and living in those days, and I stand as a witness to that, that I witnessed that, and it was horrific and it was horrendous. And the, the darks of this planet took it out of the scriptures for a reason. It's because they do not want people to know about multiple probations. They didn't want people to know about the vision he had. They didn't want to know so much and you look at what at, at what isaiah put in the scriptures related to christ and the last days and they were trying to silence him as well as many of the other prophets that served with him in his councils and um and i i give my witness to the universe of that and the role that isaiah played and that he still plays in trying to help people ascend uh what what the patterns are is you have these groups of people that come often in families uh, sometimes people are married to each other again, um, often. They might have the same parents or they might have the same sisters or friends. And they will also have some of the same betrayers. The, the reality I see is that in many of our churches, and it's not just uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but other churches, those who are playing uh, what are apparently key roles that um, that are sounding like Pharisees and Sadducees, it's because they really were Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm -hmm. They have come back again. The adversary puts his puzzle pieces on the, on the, I guess you could say his chess pieces, and we put our chess pieces. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, basically, we basically uh, have a chess game, if you will. War strategies at play. And they make their move, and we make our move. They go the offensive, we go defensive. And the opposition helps us ascend it helps push us forward when you have opposition when you have dark energy that comes at you you cannot stay stable you cannot it's a it's a energetic chaos and so you naturally seek to find stability and to get rid of the chaos and as you do you ascend you find light because the only stability in the universe if there is such a thing the only calm the only peace is light and when you are in darkness to any degree it feels chaotic and the more chaotic it feels it's a good indication you got more darkness mm -hmm. surrounding you in your space and your body and your and what you need to clear 
And when you have crap coming up in your life, instead of complaining about it, think about what you're supposed to learn and how you're supposed to serve and why that, that dark energy is surrounding you in the form of uh, bosses at work or people in your family or sometimes spouses or children that are causing you heartache. Um, it can happen in the form of the food you eat, the medical issues you have. If you have health issues, you have something to clear. It's manifesting physically in your body that there's something that needs to be cleared, either in you or in your family line. It is absolutely fascinating if you could understand the science behind this. It gets into neurophysics. It gets into all of the quantum physics and calculus and all this other stuff that, that I can't get into because people would just be like um, blown, <laughs> have a mind blow. But at the very basic level, we are working to ascend and to increase light in our energy systems, in our bodies, in our robes, so that we can become gods and goddesses one day, if we so choose. And if we don't choose, we can't stay here because this does this all the time. You either move forward or backwards. And it's this constant ebb and flow. So if you're not moving on the path of light, you are decreasing in light. And light expands darkness um, receipts. So, anyway. Well, you've just really touched on a lot there, Julie. I want to hone in on some of the concepts you mentioned, especially that of, like, the darkness that, that we have within us. Um, that goes by another name in other traditions. In Eastern uh, Asia, you know, Eastern cultures, they refer to it as karma. And and so let's just go through, let's, let's do a role play here, Julie, um, or just take an example. So let's say this uh, Manasseh, he kills Isaiah. In doing so, in creating this evil, he created some pretty bad karma for himself. And, and, and who cares whether that's the right term or not? It's probably not the right term. That's a, a distorted view of the truth, right? But just say the, the, the energy follows you. Yeah. It's not necessarily recycled, but energy doesn't go away. It just changes form. And if it doesn't change form, it will follow you. It will stick to your energy system, and it just comes with you again. And so, and you've just mentioned this idea of, the idea of ascension. How do we ascend if we have that, fo that negative energy following us? Well, let's take Manasseh then. He kills this prophet. He's created some negative energy that will follow him. If he chooses to work through it, he can ascend. If he does not, he won't ascend. Is that right? Do I right. have that basically right. right? So I know personally, uh, I know that Manasseh is on the earth again. I was just going to tell you, they're telling <laughs> me to let the whole world know. I know Manasseh's on the earth. <laughs> I know Isaiah's on the earth. And I know that their paths are going to cross. <laughs> and, and why would they do that? Well, on both parts, Isaiah can offer who's on the earth can offer an opportunity for Manasseh to ascend. And and it's likely that Manasseh will still harbor some of those negative feelings he once had. And so, so it really is a tender mercy. And this really is at the heart of the doctrine of multiple probations, ascension. If you, yes. if you want to work through something, the only way to do it is blindfolded. You come back to earth, you're veiled, and you have to demonstrate to heaven that you are ready and willing and able to move on. And so we are often put in the same situations we've faced in previous lives so that we can prove that or we can work. Or primordial. Or, yeah, so that yep. we can prove and have that opportunity to progress and grow. Right. So you know what's crazy? What's crazy is when you don't have a veil or much of one, and then you find out who it was that killed you or who raped you, yeah, and you get to forgive them in a conscious level in a new body. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. It has been amazing for me, <laughs> very humbling and very difficult as I've gone public in the last five years with a number of, uh, I guess you could say, old friends and family members and lots of betrayers who have come in my path. What's humbling is when I find these people. Okay, so like for example. I had a lady that scheduled two sessions with me. I had met her in person twice before. And before she ever scheduled sessions, I knew that she had been Herodias, who was responsible for John the Baptist's head on a platter. The same woman had tried to seduce Joseph of Egypt as Pilate, I mean, as Potiphar's wife. Same woman. 
I know this because I can see what I can see. The spirit tells me I understand. I have a clear understanding of who this woman is. I meet her. And she says to me, I know I know you. I know I've known you for a long time. And I know I have too, because I've known her on four worlds. And she's chosen to be a dark individual since her first world. And she is responsible for murdering thousands of people. And she has no idea. She is completely veiled from it. And she is currently a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's called a tender mercy of the Lord. That's right. I can't imagine, I can't imagine what it would be like for her if she was unveiled in this body and knew who she was and what she'd done. The veil is a blessing. Quit complaining that you don't have my gifts or somebody else's because when you have the gifts and the veil comes off, you are left to be accountable to forgive even people like that, that you know are responsible for killing your family members and trying to kill you because Herodias wanted me dead. But, you know, the crazy thing is, is that whatever happened between that probation and this one, she comes to the earth now. I still see her darkness she's struggling with. She's got thousands of contracts. And she sends me an email and says she loves me and that she knows she knows me primordially and that she knows something has happened in our past where she feels like she needs to right a wrong. <laughs> but she has no idea what it is. To which I get to reply, I love you too. Wow. I forgive you. That's some power in the atonement, you guys. It takes it to a whole new level. It really does. I'm yelling. <laughs> <laughs> I feel strongly about the atonement, about agency, about having a veil, about how blessed we are that mm -hmm. we get to come and do it again. And not remember all the crap that we went through last time some people get overwhelmed the adversary says when they find out about multiple operations <sighs> life is so hard now you don't want to do this again i can't you can't stand the thought of having to go through another mortal probation i promise you no one's ever made to do it you go back to the heavens or wherever you came from if you came from a dark realm you go back there unless you've corrected the energy and then you get a chance to come back again. You get a chance to break those contracts. You get a chance to forgive your loved ones who betrayed you or molested you or raped you or did something. You get a chance to forgive the people that sold you into slavery. I'm talking to people on both sides of the veil. And that's why I'm talking this way. There are people on the other side of the veil that went through horrendous things while they were in mortality. We get a chance to forgive and we get to progress. And when we forgive ourselves for doing awful things to other people or we forgive others for doing awful things to us, we ascend into light because we learn what it's like to be a god or a goddess. Mm. There is no other way, which is why the adversary comes to people and says, hey, I can show you a shortcut. Mm -hmm. There's no shortcut. He just puts them in slavery. Mm -hmm. Being a king or queen on the Lord's team looks far different than being a king or queen on Lucifer's team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> look at corporate America. You'll look at the structure of Lucifer's team. That's, that's corporate America. That's exactly the right. CEO makes all the money, runs the show, gets all the vacation, all the, the shareholders get the get the big bucks and they get the money. And everybody else makes nine dollars an hour if you're lucky. Actually, most of Lucifer's team, they don't make any money at all. I'm using it as a metaphor. What it really looks like is they're locked in prisons with chains and ropes and gag responses and they literally do this to people they sold trade they harvest them it is horrific the things that i see you guys be thankful for a veil and realize that here on planet earth we don't have it so bad we have an opportunity to learn and grow and ascend into better places when i say there's a greater tomorrow Oh my gosh, do we have good things coming to this earth? Mm. It's going to be so beautiful, but we have to make it happen. We have to ascend together. I can't do it alone. Eric can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. This is a family thing. When we are gathering, we are gathering the family on both sides of the veil. That's what this dispensation is, and this is what we have been asked to do. And this is what we wanted to do. That's why we came here. Well said, Julie. I think that's probably a good place to wrap up uh, this episode, If you, unless you have anything okay. else to say. Just that I love you guys. 
Okay. Thanks for letting me clear energy today. I had some more, didn't I? <laughs> sure, but... The older you are, the more you have to clear. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. I lot of, got, a, got a lot of stuff to clear out, so... Right. Well, we'll just continue this here. We're going to stay right here and just start another episode. You guys can tune in to episode number four right here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, you guys. See you soon.